Joseph Yunga Tigre is a student at University of Miami. He did his undergraduate degree at Rutgers. He grew up in New Jersey. He did his major in biological sciences there before continuing on to Miami, uh, where he's been mentored by a number of colleagues who we know well, Dr. Levy, uh, among others. Um, he's going to be presenting a case of uh, Chiari malformation and a bony decompression uh, for that patient. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for your time and opportunity to present. Uh, today, I'm going to be presenting on the surgical decompression with, uh, sorry, with um, dural scoring for AQRE type 1 malformation. Uh, this is a case that I observed that Dr. Betterson uh, did. So to start off, I'd just go, like to go over the clinical presentations. We had a 35-year-old female who initially presented 12 years ago for evaluation of headaches. And following workup, she was diagnosed with Chiari type 1 malformation. She was initially uh, being conservatively managed. She was routinely being followed by neurology for headache management, as well as Chiari type 1 malformation surveillance. Of note, she also had a past medical history of depression, uh, CKD, and uh, increased intracranial hypertension. And so about eight months ago, she had a whiplash, whiplash injury and afterwards had an exacerbation of her symptoms that were negatively affecting her activities of daily living. She endorsed daily severe headaches, neck pain, lightheadedness, as well as associated tingling sensation to the back of her head, syncopal episodes, nausea, and a sensation of loss of bowel and bladder control. And so regarding her neuro neurological exam, um, her cranial nerves were intact. Uh, she did not have any cellular uh, anomalies and motor and sensory and reflexes were all normal. So here are her neural imaging findings. We can see a sagittal T2 and T1 MRI of the cervical spine. And what we notice is that the cellular barrel tonsils are herniated through the foramen magnum uh, about 1.2 centimeters, um, as can be seen in this left image here. Um, and so to give a little more background about Chiari malformations, um, this pretty much describes a group of deformities of the posterior fossa and hindbrain. And these deformities can range from cerebellar tonsil herniation through the foramen magnum to the absence of the cerebellum, um, as well as having intra and extracranial defects, such as a syrinx, hydrocephalus, and cephalocele. And so to go more into the classification of Chiari malformations, um, Chiari malformations can be broken down from one to all the way to four, um, as well as uh, five is also included in the literature, but most often uh, Chiari malformations refer to one and two. And so a Chiari type 1 malformation uh, is pretty much described by the descent of the cerebellar tonsils by 5 millimeters. And this is usually measured uh, drawing a horizontal line between the basion and the opistion, as seen yeah. in this uh, depiction to our right. And then Chiari malformation type 2 includes descent of the cerebellar vermis and brains into the cervical canal, as well as being associated with extracranial manifestations such as a meningitis. And so to go more into the uh, background of the pathophysiology, patients typically become symptomatic through direct compression of the neurological structures against the spinal canal and the foramen magnum, as well as development of a syringomyelocele and syringoboblia. Uh, and as a result of this obstructed CSF flow, a syrinx can form, and as the syrinx expands within the spinal canal, uh, the patients uh, will become symptomatic. And so common presenting symptoms include suboccipital headaches, neck pain, vision changes, as well as dizziness, hearing loss, vertigo, and gait ataxia. So regarding evaluation, typically uh, patients are evaluated uh, with an MRI of the head and cervical spine. And as we can see from our patient, um, in order to be classified as carry one malformation, we need to see a cerebral or tonsil herniation of greater than five millimeters below the frame and magnum as well as if a syrinx is present, then a further MRI of the thoracic and lumbar spine would be needed for evaluation. And just to go, go into a little bit about PRE2 malformations, um, typically these will be identified during fetal ultrasounds during the second uh, trimester. And so regarding management, there are a couple options. Um, if the patient is asymptomatic and the PRE type, well, type 1 malformation was incidentally identified, then these patients can be observed. And interestingly, about 90% of PRE type 1 
malformation patients will remain asymptomatic. Uh, patients can also be medically managed. If these patients have minimal symptoms, um, they can be treated with NSAIDs as well as muscle relaxants to treat their headaches and neck pain. Um, however, there are surgical options for patients with persistent symptoms as well as confirmed cerebellar tonsil herniation. And the goals of surgical management are to restore CSF blood flow through the cranial vertebral junction, as well as relieving pressure between the cerebellum and high brain through a posterior fossa decompression. Um, and so to go into the surgical techniques, uh, posterior fossa decompression is typically gonna include suboccipital craniectomy, often with a C1 and potentially a C2 uh, laminectomy. And a duroplasty can also be performed in which the occipital fascia or the tensor fascia lot attendant or an artificial dura may be used as a graft. And if the cerebellar tonsils are herniated, we can also cauterize. So here's an example of some duroplasty. So as we can see here, uh, bony decompression is going to be performed in A, and we can use an autologous graft, such as a pericranium, uh, which is shown here in B, or we could use a uh, non-autologous graft, such as Durgen, shown in C. And recently, what we could see uh, for Chiari 1 malformations, less invasive options are being advocated, such as posterior fossa decompression alone or with doral scoring. And this paper right here previously reported that the outcomes have been similar for various procedures, which include scoring the dora, dora opening, arachnoid dissection, as well as exploring the fourth ventricle and shrinking the cerebellar tonsil. Um, and to go back into the Chiari 2 malformation, since these uh, type 2 malformations are identified in utero, Typically, surgical correction of the myelomeningeal and uterus is performed, and if suboccipital decompression is needed, uh, that can be performed later on. And so some complications that we want to be aware for uh, during the surgery include CSF leak, vertebral artery injury, meningitis, pseudomeningeal, lower brain stem malfunction, and infection. And what, uh, what this paper found was that the pseudomeningeal was actually the most common uh, complication encountered in this type of surgery. And following postoperative care, patients should be monitored for CSF leak, um, as, well as, as well as if patients develop a pseudomeningocele, then drainage may be required. Typically, exercise and heavy lifting should be avoided for three to four weeks after surgery. And if a preoperative syrinx is present, then a repeat MRI uh, is required for syrinx evaluation. So regarding our case, uh, we performed a, I'm sorry, uh, regarding the case, a suboccipital craniectomy was performed as well as a C1 laminectomy and scoring of the superficial dora. Um, and here are the postoperative images where we can see that uh, the C1 lamina was removed, um, both in a coronal and sagittal image, as well as the suboccipital craniectomy. Uh, and then regarding our patient's postoperative period, no postoperative complications were encountered, and the patient was safely discharged on postoperative day two. Oh, uh, I'm sorry, I just need to share the last slide. Um, so sorry, my last slide, I just wanted to thank Dr. Betterson, who performed the case, as well as Dr. Hardigan and Dr. Lee, as well as the rest of the program for allowing me to come and do my sub-internship here. Thank you, Joseph. Peter, do you want to comment on the technique and indications since you were the one who really introduced it to Mount Sinai Hospital? Um, it may be that Saudi was doing this for a while, but I was not as aware of it. But I don't think too many of the other attending neurosurgeons have been doing it this way until you came. Yeah, I have you to know, give credit to Saudi having come from Colombia. So, Saudi, why don't you talk first? Yeah, sorry, I sorry to interrupt you. You know, uh, Neil Feldstein uh, introduced this to me after I learned from Rich Ellenbogen about you know the maximal uh, approach which was dural opening tonsillar reduction arachnoid uh, fenestration and so this was very uh, novel from my perspective and when I saw that it was working and the kids were going home the next day and I was able to avoid all of the miseries of pseudomeningocele and chemical meningitis it was uh, something that transformed my practice. Of course, it has to be the right indication, and I use it. I, I will not use it. I will not use it in the setting of a new neurological deficit and a major syrinx. Uh, but we know we have this discussion all the time in our case management conference about it, and Chan 
uh, can weigh in on this also because he has a lot of experience with it. But I'm I'm just delighted, uh, JB. It just warms my heart to see to see your adoption of this. Yeah, it hurt my it hurt my joints and hurt all the stiff parts of my body to do this. But <laughs> um, you know, it was it was Peter just hemp slowly tapping the hammer uh, over the last couple of years that that convinced me and he showed me that this was properly proper way to do it. And I will say she bounced right out of this. And this was not a bouncy sort of person. Uh, she really, you know, she was primed to, uh, you know, to stay for a long time. Um, so, you know, I, I, I'm going to be doing more of this, I think. It's not quite as big an operation. It may not be quite as, uh, you know, may not be the same experience for the resident. But uh, you really can't beat it if, if it works. Paolo, I see that you're on. Do you have any thoughts on this? Um, yes. Um, first of all, every candle carry technique has uh, every candle carry technique helps uh, from the least invasive to the most invasive. In perspective, this dual scoring was introduced by the Japanese in the late nineties. Uh, other thing is that the extradural technique was uh, used by Mirat and I in the late nineties. We we used it for about four years. And then we stopped doing it. And we started doing it because we, we were seeing in, improvement of the SSCPs during the craniectomy part and the dual scores. Uh, but at the five-year uh, mark, uh, we, we were not having the, the outcomes we were looking for. We were having a one-third failure rate. It all depends where you put the bar for, you know, for what an acceptable post-operative outcome. And, Mirrored being a, a picky guy, uh, his his bar was very high. Uh, second thing is, um, years later, uh, but something like four years after we stopped using the uh, the extra dura with the scoring, uh, Feldstein started doing it for the same reason because during the cranny he was seeing an improvement of the SSCPs. Uh, right now in the Pediatric, uh, pediatric neurosurgery, you know, extra dural techniques are favored because the, the dura is a little bit thinner and there is no, and the, and the incidence of reverse spinal fluid leakage, then, then you have to deal with the patient and the family it is more favorable. But uh, recently we did a, uh, we did a uh, poll out of all the people, uh, out about uh, 75 people who were the top scorers from four different continents. And uh, all the people above 600 with more than 600, more than 900 cases in their experience, they all had uh, intradural techniques with uh, tonsillar manipulation as their go to uh, case. And all the people with more than 1,000 cases, and we were five of them. Uh, not only they had that, but they also had an incident of cerebral spinal fluid leakage, which was comparable to that one of the people with the extra dural technique. So the point is that the more you do it, the, the more the, the feared pseudomeningocele, uh, you know, goes down to, to a very low incidence. Like I've done 1600 carry surgeries. My last ESF leakage was on the day of my birthday in 2003 so it, you can you can achieve a sub uh, a sub 1% out of repetition uh, other Great, thing thank is you that, very uh, much paolo i appreciate good. your your comment um, and i'm sure we have a lot more to hear from you on on this topic uh, peter in the in the interest of the six students do we 